The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings. What happened in this house is an absolute nightmare. A family that claims it's being sexually molested by a sinister entity. It was trying to rape me. And a special investigation of a Pennsylvania town haunted by frightening close encounters with UFOs. All of a sudden, these objects started coming up out of the treetops. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Thanks to you, we've received many home videos showing what may be the brief appearance of UFOs. But one of the problems we face is that it's very difficult to analyze a one-time event. Ufologists are looking for UFOs that appear again and again and offer a chance for closer examination. Just such a series of UFO encounters is occurring in the skies above Pennsylvania. A local resident sent us his startling footage. The first reported sighting occurred in 1991 in Newton Township, just north of Scranton. Since then, dozens of people, including state and local police, have witnessed an unexplained show of lights. The first home video was shot by Gary Steyer. He started monitoring the skies after his daughter, Christy, reported a bizarre encounter with a UFO. I at first thought it was another car. But I looked out towards the back of me, and I noticed there was no car in back of me. And I, I was adjusting the mirror, and I noticed an object in the sky. It was flying behind my car, and I kept watching it in my rearview mirror. And eventually it went over to where I could see it looking out the window. It kept following me, driving down the road. And then I made a right-hand turn to come up onto the road coming up towards my house. And this object made a right hand turn and by this point I was getting really scared. She drove into the driveway, ran up to the front door, came flying in the house and said something was following her and then when she told me it was above her car I didn't know what she was talking about. Since Christy had been the only one to experience the light phenomenon the Steyers thought it must have been an isolated event. But a few months later, the lights returned, and this time the extraterrestrial display was witnessed by more than just one person. While driving home on January 8th, Gary and his wife Nadia saw unusual lights hovering in the distance near their house. They rushed home, and Gary got out his video camera. This time, he was able to get the UFO on tape. It was uh, a feeling of great excitement because these things were happening right before your eyes. You didn't know really what these lights were, what was happening. Uh, it was like an adventure. Being a respected school teacher, Gary Steyer was hesitant to call the authorities, fearing public ridicule. But when the lights continued hovering for several hours, he finally decided to alert the police. 911 emergency. You want to report what? And within a matter of minutes, Officer Kelly arrived along with three state policemen. And as I taped, they stood alongside of me with their handheld radios in my front yard. The dispatcher told me he received a call from a resident in the community that there was a uh, strange object in the air above his house. When he initially called me, uh, he didn't want to give me anything but his street address. He didn't want to give me his uh, full name or phone number uh, because he didn't want to be associated with something that sounded this bizarre. I didn't believe initially when I received the call that I, there would be anything of substance to that I would see. Immediately upon exiting my police vehicle, I looked up in the air and I saw four or five bright objects up in the air. There's one right alongside one of it. The three towers over Another one just flashed. Officer Kelly called into his dispatcher and asked him to check with the local airport tower to see if they were picking up anything on radar. Lights. All right, well, let me look. It was one of those real crystal clear nights. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. We looked out the window over towards where, where he was talking about, and uh, 
sure enough, there were some lights out there. According to local sources, there were no commercial or military aircraft in the area that night, and nothing was picked up on radar. But despite this, half a dozen witnesses reported seeing a UFO. They had no aircraft uh, in the area of the Triple Towers, and that uh, no airplanes were supposed to be in that area, and nothing was picked up on radar. I felt that there was possibly a problem with the radar system. Uh, shortly thereafter, he contacted me back and said that they checked it again, and there's nothing up there. The lights appear to be most active over this area, Bald Mountain. Pam Zakowski is a local newspaper reporter who first broke the UFO story. She was an impartial observer until she hiked to the top of Bald Mountain with UFO investigator Irene MacDonald. Near the summit, the two women had a terrifying encounter. We were merely poking around, actually trying to see where, where Gary Steyer's house was from the top of the mountain. When two men in a pickup truck pulled up, drove up the access road, and they both got out, and one was older and one was younger. They both had guns, and they were incredibly angry. They said, you're trespassing, you know you're trespassing, what are you doing up here? I said we were just taking a, a walk in the winter. I wasn't going to say we were up there looking for evidence of UFOs. When I saw their intense anger and their guns, I knew that in 30 seconds or a minute, I either would be alive or I wouldn't be. We agreed to leave, but we had only been up there probably maybe five minutes at the most and what's unusual is the fact that almost everybody at one time or another in, in this area has climbed that mountain for exercise or recreation and never have, have been threatened with a gun. Pam Zikoski never saw the two men again and believes they were not local. She ran a search on their license plate number but that has only deepened the mystery. The plate number does not exist in any Pennsylvania motor vehicle record. The identity of the two men is still unknown. Could their appearance be somehow related to the unexplained lights in the area? After the incident on Bald Mountain, the UFO activity has only increased, and more witnesses have come forward. It was just about dusk, and as we were there up by the power lines, all of a sudden, these objects started coming up out of the treetops. They were just everywhere. Seeing wherever we turned, there was another one. I just remembered not hearing a sound. But not everyone in the area believes the lights are UFOs. Karen and Bob Siemens own the airport in Factoryville, about 10 miles south of Bald Mountain. They believe people are simply sighting their newly installed beacon. I think because we had put a new beacon up and people in the area were not used to seeing the light, I really think it's just too much of a coincidence. Investigating the Siemens theory further, we took Gary Steyer's footage and overlaid footage of the airport beacon taken from the same angle. Using a grid system, it appears impossible for the beacon and the lights to be one and the same. We also took the videotape to ufologist Jeff Senyo. After careful analysis, Senyo has concluded that the lights are not conventional aircraft, nor are they a hoax, and they're definitely not emanating from the beacon. My impression of this tape is that it certainly wasn't faked. Here, all of the unusual lights are moving laterally. And so an airport beacon light doesn't move laterally. So that couldn't explain any of the five interesting points that I found on this tape. As if in response to increased interest in the lights, the UFO activity has subsided in recent months. But the people of Newton Township keep their eyes and camcorders pointed to the sky, anticipating the return of what some believe is an alien spacecraft. All I know is that we taped some unusual lights and objects in the sky. The night of January 8th did happen, and I wasn't the only person that saw these things. There were hundreds of other people who had similar experiences, but they didn't have video cameras in their hands. And all I can say about the tape is that it speaks for itself. Right now, the skies near Scranton are quiet. However, local residents say that the UFOs come in cycles, and they're anticipating a new wave of UFO encounters in coming months. Local police are ready to respond to any UFO calls that come in and are continuing to investigate reports of the mysterious men who have yet to be identified.
Coming up next. What happened in this house is an absolute nightmare. A family that's under attack by a sinister entity. He said, make love to me. Researchers who investigate sightings of ghosts and apparitions often find that the site of the haunting has a mysterious, sometimes brutal, past. When one of our viewers called to report bizarre ghost activity in her house, our first step was to look into the history of the house, and we did find that it had been a place of misery and torment. The evil began in 1984 in a small town in central Maryland. It's the kind of town that seems to promise the American dream. But two brothers were living a nightmare in one house in this quiet town. For a long time, it was their secret. But the day the boys, age four and six, told their mother, she told the police. What happened in this house to those two children uh, is an absolute nightmare. The children were raped and molested repeatedly. They weren't safe uh, because of the danger that lived within, and that danger lied uh, in, in their own father. He was convicted of sexual child abuse, but the boys insisted they were not the only victims. They described the brutal rape and murder of an infant. I don't think it's far-fetched to believe that a baby could be uh, stabbed repeatedly, uh, dismembered, and then decapitated, and then uh, literally tossed into a creek. And of course, that's what we believe happened in this particular circumstance. The police found no proof of murder. The father served just 18 months in prison. The house, with its monstrous memories, was sold to another family. Just six weeks after moving in, the new owner died suddenly, leaving his wife and three daughters alone in a house they now believe is haunted by an entity they call the Beast. This beast has molested, raped, choked. He's touched, he's punched, he's scratched, and I just feel like it's getting stronger. The first time something had happened to me, I was laying in my bed, and I woke up for no reason, and I heard this breathing and I could feel it in my ear. It was like <sighs> he said in a real deep voice, he was like, make love to me. It was pinching my breast very hard and it just squeezed me on my behind. It was like I was being sexually assaulted by it. Like it was taking itself and entering into my body. The family fled the house and called sightings for help. They sent this video, a record of the night the so-called beast scratched the 13-year-old daughter. First it scratched me on this side of my face, and it hurt too bad. Then it scratched me on this side of my face, and it actually broke the skin down here, and it was bleeding. And I was just crying hysterical, and it was saying, your family can pay its respects now because you're mine. And it was saying, you can run, but you can't hide. The family refused to return to the house alone. Sightings agreed to send a team of ghost experts from the Office of Scientific Investigation and Research. When we go into a home to investigate, we look at, first and foremost, the environmental factors that are contributing to the situation. We look at the physiological elements, and we look at the psychological elements of all those in the family. Specialists descended on the house, armed with technology. Their aim was to electronically document any appearance by the supposed beast. We call it a beast because of the size of it. I remember I looked up and I could see it and it was, it was just huge. I was not imagining it, I was not sleeping. It was very, very real to me. And then I felt the tongue. There was a very pointed tongue. The thing pushed me back on the bed. And when it did, I felt this extreme weight on me. It started screaming at me, very raspy, very deep voice, and it was like, whoa, 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 and it just kept doing it and doing it. And of course, at this point, I'm screaming. I was laying in the bed next to her, and her body, it was like her heels were on the bed, and her head and shoulders were on the bed, but the rest of her body was arched up like a bridge. I know without a doubt that it was trying to have sex with me, and it was trying to rape me, and I was just powerless. There was just nothing I could do. It is terrifying. It's not something to sit around the kitchen table and say, oh, ha-ha, the ghost was calling my name last night, or the ghost wanted to have sex with me last night. Isn't that funny? It's not funny at all. Because of the women's terror, 
we had a security firm install 24-hour surveillance cameras throughout the house. Investigative devices were also put in place for the night-long vigil. The team prepared to monitor the environment, radioactivity, changes in light and electromagnetism, and the temperature, sound frequencies, and gravitational forces within the house. The neighborhood was also scoured for evidence of unusual levels of pollution or energy from power lines, something to scientifically explain the phenomenon that plagues this family. I've seen a tall man, very skinny, long arms. It was just like a flash of light, and it was so fast, and it just, it was at the end of the bed, and that just, like, you know, startled me. Just like, just like, did a belly flop right on me. And I was like, stuck in this position, and I couldn't move, and I was like, Mom, Mom, but I could not get my voice out. I was like, Mom. It was like pins and needles, but it was coming from the inside out instead of the outside in. It came off me, and I just felt like my whole body just lifted right off the bed, and I fell down. It was very frightening. The first night back in the house, the family crowded into one bedroom and refused to turn out the light. Okay, oh, let's lay down. Good night. Good night. Everyone say their prayers. They tossed and turned, five in one bed, four other bedrooms empty. Your feet are freezing. Would you shut up? This is the most aggravating time. Shh. Let's rest. After midnight, one daughter came into the living room for a cigarette. It's about two o'clock in the morning. And this usually seems to be the time when it'll start building up and you'll start hearing sounds in the house if anything's going to happen. And by three is usually when it gets to the peak. If everybody's sleeping and the house is quiet, that's when it seems like it's the strongest. I feel like it's here, and I wish if it was, it would just show itself or do something. The night passed without incident. Day two brought more tests. Psychiatrist Elizabeth Targ worked with the family. It feels like your heart is beating like very hard against your chest. I feel like I can't breathe. I felt like I was dying. <laughs> Technician John Pori conducted physiological tests. The family agreed to sleep that night with the lights out, heads wired to measure sleep patterns and dreams. Our camera was equipped with a night lens to photograph the house in darkness. Christopher Chacon monitored the sensing equipment. This was one night the women wanted something to happen, but again, the house was silent. Everything that we saw in the house on Yudishu Road and everything that's been told to us by the family members could be rationally explained in one way or another according to the laws of nature and physics. I still feel as strongly as we did in the first interview that those things happen in reality. They actually did happen, and they happen the way that I explained them. It's the eternal question for paranormal investigators. If nothing happens, is it all a hoax? Or is the terror the family calls the beast lurking in the background, waiting for the investigators to leave before it will return? I still feel there's a lot of evil in this house. I think that it's the devil personally, and I don't think it's finished. The inability to catch a ghost on tape has proven to be the ultimate frustration for investigators like Christopher Chacon. They continue to work on new, less obtrusive methods of studying ghosts and haunting phenomena. Until then, the only proof we have that ghosts and poltergeists exist rests with eyewitness testimony. Coming up next, meet the real-life victim of the alien abduction behind the upcoming movie Fire in the Sky. They have these big bulging heads and these huge eyes. In 1975, Travis Walton, a logger from Snowflake, Arizona, disappeared without a trace. Five friends who were with Walton when he vanished swore that he'd been abducted by an alien spacecraft. Each witness passed a lie detector test telling the same story. The reported abduction is one of the most well-documented claims of an alien encounter on record. Travis Walton's alleged abduction from an Arizona logging camp is now a motion picture titled Fire in the Sky. The dramatic details of Walton's story are unnatural for abduction to the big screen. But ufologists believe that Walton's experience is more than just a story. They believe it is a true account of alien abduction. We have a saying here, once a contactee or once a witness, it's always so, because it's an event that you will never forget. Are aliens with sinister motives abducting humans for bizarre experimentation? Travis Walton believes that's what happened to him. Sightings took an emotionally scarred Walton and eyewitness Mike Rogers back to the site of the alleged abduction 17 years before. 
As we're coming up this road here, we could kind of see a light filtering through the trees. My first reflex was that this thing was just going to take right off, you know, that we were just going to get a glimpse of this thing. So just as soon as it stopped, I threw open the door and I started running towards it. And then I realized, you know, <laughs> this ain't going anywhere. I started to think twice about what I was doing. And as I got closer, I kind of got slower and slower. I turned back around like this and, and I could see Walton. He's flying backwards through the air. And when he hit the ground, when I saw that happen, everything was just too much. And, I hit the gas and we were gone. When I regained consciousness, I was in a lot of pain. I saw these creatures. They were small, human, humanoid looking, you know, like they had two arms and two legs and two eyes, but they had these big bulging heads and these huge eyes. And those eyes were the hardest thing for me. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't look at them. It seemed like they could, like they were looking right through me. Screenwriter Tracy Torme has spent eight years bringing this abduction story to the screen. He is convinced that Travis Walton and his fellow loggers are telling the truth. I suddenly came to realize that this incident was a curse to them. It was, it was something that had happened to them rather than some kind of happy, you know, close encounter type of experience. Since Travis Walton's experience, hundreds of others have come forward to tell similar stories. They share with Walton the nagging fear that someday the aliens will come back for them. The question has come, um, do we think Travis will have a second encounter? We have no way of predicting that. We don't consider this case closed. It's still open. The investigations you've seen tonight were all the result of phone calls received from viewers like you. If you've recorded or experienced what you believe to be paranormal phenomena, our sightings investigative team wants to know. If you've had a paranormal experience, call our sightings hotline at 1-900-740-SIGHT. Each call 75 cents a minute, average call lasts two minutes, and you must be 18 years or older. Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Stay tuned for another episode of Sightings. Tomorrow, after a full hour of cops, meet the most dangerous mobster in America on an all-new America's Most Wanted special. And Sunday, the incomparable Dame Edna dishes the dirt with guest stars Roseanne and Tom Arnold and Luke Perry on Edna Time, Sunday at 10, 9 central.